Right. Good afternoon, friends, and welcome. My name is Lauren, and I am here to welcome you all to Indies Unite. So please join me. A very big, quick virtual round of applause as we let everybody get logged in here and we get started. Woo! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here and for joining us from all over the place. We are so excited to have such an amazing event with you today. For those of you that don't know, we are Indies Unite, and we are here with you today in partnership with bookshop.org, Children's Book Council, and Children's Book Week to bring you a huge celebration of community and culture with our incredible panelists who are here with us today. A little bit about Indies Unite, in case you don't know, we are made up of seven independent bookstores across the country that have joined forces to put on collaborative events that challenge the status quo, question our current standards, and leave no curiosity left unexplored. We launched in 2020, and we have brought several events to people all over the US, including educators, parents, and readers of all ages. Attendees and participants are encouraged to share their experience on social media using the hashtag Indies Unite 2022, which you can do today while you're joining us live. We do have bookstores, Boogie Down Books in New York, Blue Manatee Literacy Project in Ohio, Little Shop of Stories in Georgia, Monkey See Monkey Do in New York, Politics and Prose in DC, River Dog Books in Wisconsin, and Second Star to the Right in Denver, or in Colorado. Sorry, I forgot what a state was. <laughs> That's my home store. And we're so excited to welcome you all here today. Just a little bit about this event. I promise I'm not going to talk the whole time. You just have to bear with me a little bit longer and then we'll get to our incredible panelists. We do have our moderator and panelists here today. We're going to share a conversation with you. There will be a chance at the end for some Q&A. So if you do have a question for any of the panelists, you can put that in the Q&A and we will have that for later. We have disabled the chat for this event, so you won't be able to use that. But again, you can use that Q&A for any questions that pop into your head during this event. And for the safety of the authors and the participants, we will be using a webinar virtual event platform format and the event will be monitored to immediately shut down any negative interaction. Indies Unite events seek to provide a harassment-free experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity and expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, religion, or lack thereof, class or technology issues, choices. Harassment in any form is not tolerated. Sexual or racist language and imagery is not appropriated and not tolerated. Anyone violating these rules will be expelled from this event and all future events. That's all the stuff that we have to get out of the way before we get started. Thanks for bearing with me, friends. Without further ado, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our moderator and panelists, and then I'll hand it off to our amazing moderator, Kevin. So up first, we do have our moderator, Kevin Maylard, who is a professor, at law, professor of law at Syracuse University, a contributor to the New York Times and co-founder of Blackstream Partners, LLC. He's written for The Atlantic and has provided on-air on commentary to ABC News and MSNBC. He's the debut author of Fry Bread, a Native American family story a picture book illustrated by Juana Martinez Neal, which won the Cyber Medal and the American Indian Youth Literature Honor. He's an enrolled member of the Seminole Na Nation of Oklahoma, and he's based in Manhattan, New York. A our first panelist that we have up today uh, is Raul III. He is the New York Times bestselling, three times Pura Belpre award-winning author illustrator of the World of Vamos series and the illustrator of the Schneider Family Award honoree Stunt Boy, in the meantime, written by Jason Reynolds. He lives in Boston, Massachusetts with, with his New York Times bestselling collaborator, Elaine Bay. 
We also have panelist Michael Genhart, PhD, who is a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice in San Francisco and Mill Valley, California. He lives with his family in Marin County. He received his BA in psychology from the University of California, San Diego, and has his PhD in clinical and community psychology from the University of Maryland, College Park. He is the author of several picture books, including Ouch! Moments When Words Are Used in Hurtful Ways, Peanut Butter and Jellyus, Mac and G's, so many others. And, they, and he is here today to share them all with us. We also have Andrea Wang, an acclaimed author of children's books. Her book, Watercrest, was awarded the Caldecott Medal, a Newbery Honor, the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature, a New England Book Award, and a Boston Globe Porn Book Honor. Her other books, The Many Meanings of Milan, Magic Ramen, and The Nyan Monster, have also received awards and starred reviews. Her work explores culture, creative thinking, and identity. She is also the author of seven nonfiction titles for the library and school market. Andrea holds an MS in environmental science and an MFA in creative writing for young people. She lives in Colorado with her family and can be found online and on Twitter. And last but not least, we have Cheryl Yao Chepasova, who is a designer, writer, and author of the Big City's Little Foodies Travel Series. As a Hong Kong native and city dweller, she has traveled around Asia and also lived and worked in Toronto, New York, and most recently, San Francisco. Her writing has appeared in Design Observer, Metropolis, Print, and others. She spends her days designing apps and software for companies like Slack, Pinterest, The New York Times, and Squarespace. She enjoys picnics with her two children, teaching them multiple languages, and learning about the world together through picture books. What an amazingly talented group we have here today. How about one more huge round of applause as we welcome our moderator to kick things off, Kevin Maylard. Woo! Hi, thank you so much. And I'm gonna start this off by having each one of our author panelists do a show and tell. So we've all brought an object that explains something about us, uh, maybe the work we do, maybe something about our family. So I'm gonna start off and then I'm going to hand this off to Andrea. So I, this is not my show and tell, but this is fry bread. But I want you to look on the cover of the book and grandma is holding a baby. That's my baby daughter, baby Peregrine. And she's holding a bowl of fry bread. This bowl is in the Seminole Nation Museum in Weewoka, Oklahoma, which is my mom's hometown. And I wanted to put some art in the book that was from Weewoka. So I bought the bowl from this man by the name of Afton Qual. He made this bowl in 2017. You can see his name and the date on the back of the bowl. This bowl is really, really heavy. It's made out of black walnut. And he used something called milliput, which is like ink. And then he takes dowel rods, which are just round pieces of wood, to paint around each one of these dowel rods. So this must have taken him a long time to make. This bowl was super expensive. It was so much, but then I had to buy it because nobody else could have the book, have the bowl because it was on the cover of the book. So that's my show and tell, this big, heavy, very expensive bowl that is probably my most prized object uh, that I have. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Andrea. Thank you, Kevin. That is so cool. I love that bowl. It's so thick, like the walls of it. It's just, it's hefty. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, my show and tell is this tea canister and it has cranes on it. And it's tea is like an iconic drink of China. And that's where it was discovered, the, the tea leaves, like I don't know, a thousand or so or more years ago when supposedly tea leaves 
blew into the cup of hot water of one of the emperors while he was out traveling. And I don't know that I would drink something that leaves fell into, but he did. And now we have tea. And actually it is the subject of my new book that comes out in a few weeks called Luli and the Language of Tea. Um, and it's about how the word for tea um, in over 200 different languages comes from the Chinese words for tea in a couple of dialects. And as tea was shipped around the world, um, that word in Chinese, which is cha in Mandarin, like changed and morphed into chai and chai and sha and all these other you know, forms, tea and te as well. So this is actually a tea canister that was my parents. And I found it in their belongings after they had passed away. So it's very special to me. It's very sentimental. There's not tea in it anymore. But I looked and the company that makes this kind of tea was founded in 1960. So it's hopefully, you know, and kind of a vintage antique type of thing, but it's very special to me. Uh, so that's my show and tell for the day. And I am going to pass it over to Cheryl. Hi, um, I brought a rice paddle. So um, I was looking for a utensil that I actually have multiples of, and I was trying to think of something that was unique. I love this, I use it all the time. Um, it's just a staple for our um, East Asian diet, and it has a lot of texture on it. It helps to fluff off the rice after it's been steamed. And um, I thought about how interesting and how unique that, um, different utensils can be in cuisines. And that was actually something that my illustrator and I considered a lot when we wrote um, my book, Noodles, Please. And we were thinking about how to depict the, the different utensils um, used to, to eat noodles. And so, yeah, this is one that is um, pretty important to my family. And so I decided to share this one today. And I am going to pass it on to Michael. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, good. So hello, everyone. It's such a treat to be able to present or talk about uh, one of my latest books, May Your Life Be Deliciosa, um, illustrated by Lotus Laura, who just won a put a bold prey honor for this book. So very thrilled for her. This is a story that's about family and tradition and storytelling, but also about oral history passed on from one generation to the next within a family. So here's the setting for the, for the story. It's Christmas day and Rosie and her family go to Abuela's house for a tamalada, a traditional tamale making party. And Abuela shows Rosie the many steps to make a delicious tamale. And along the way, she imparts a little wisdom and, and some wishes about how to make a delicious life as well. And in the end, grown up Rosie passes on the same tradition to her son. I wanted to share with you a photo of my mom. You can see she's a taller of the two girls standing next to her sister in front of, in front of my uh, mis abuelos. This is in Southern California. They're a very hardworking family, a very proud Mexican-American family. When I was growing up, one of my favorite days of the year was a tamalada. It's a very popular uh, tradition, again, in Mexican-American families. All the women gather in the kitchen, and then there was me. Um, recipes are not written down, so you watch and learn again from one generation to the next. Making tamales is a lot of work, but it's so much fun because in our kitchen, ranchera music was playing in the background. People break into dance and singing. There's lots of stories shared during this time while we're prepping the ingredients and then gathering around the table to actually assemble the tamales. I wanted to also show you the a picture of the original tamale makers. This is my mom, mi tia, mi abuela, right? It's their love and the love of this family tradition that inspired this particular story. And this wouldn't be complete without a tamale. This is a natural tamale, um, super yummy. I have on my apron, I love tamales. Um, I wanted to quickly share with you a sample of what Abuela shares with Rosie in the book. 
about making that tamale and a delicious life. You start with una hoja, a corn husk, right? You soak the husk so you can work with it. And Abuela looks into Rosie's eyes and smiles and says, Rosie, mi nieta, may you always be flexible, flexible. Then she takes the husk, the outer part of the tamale and says, may you always have protection and security. Protección, protección y seguridad. And then there are lots of other steps, working with the corn masa dough, the filling, how you fold the tamale, and then how you wait and wait and wait for that tamale is the steam. And uh, Abuela reminds us, May you always have patience with yourself and others. And then it's time to eat. Deliciosa, may your life be delicious, Abuela sings. And then the story ends with Rosie, who is now a mama, sharing her recipe with her son, sharing the recipe with her son. And now I give to you what my Abuela gave to me. You start with una hoja. And that's may your life be deliciosa. And now it's my honor honored to pass the mic on to Raul Lather. I loved your story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. By the way, the papel picado on your apron looks so good. <laughs> um, so I'm so happy to be here. And I love the fact that we're sharing something. I think the last time I did a show and tell, I must have been like this tall. So um, I, I've been, as you know, I've been working on the World of Vamos books for about three years now. Um, we went from Vamos, let's go to the market to Vamos, let's go eat. The third one is Vamos, uh, let's go read. And I have to say that none of the experiences that you find within the book would, would have been possible if not for my family, my abuelito Luis and my abuelita Susana, all of, and my mom who also worked there, all of which moved from Mexico City, El Distrito Federal, all the way up to Juarez in, El, uh, in Chihuahua, right across the way from El Paso, which is where I grew up. And it was in the late 60s that they, uh, they started to uh, sell all sorts of wonderful things at the Mercado Cuauhtémoc. Um, about three years ago, my mom uh, uh, gifted me uh, this little sombrero. And this little sombrero uh, was the, the sign that my abuelito Luis had at the had in his booth it was pretty much the store the booth sign and as you can see it says curios which are like curiosities moreno moreno is my my grandfather's last name and i love this little hat it's it's hand painted by by someone and it has a a, a, a cactus and it's got a guacamole there and maybe this is my grandfather's handwriting but I think this is such a beautiful little um, hand painted sign. And as with my books, everything was made by hand. I also think that it looks perfect right on uh, my, uh, my brand new uh, little Lobo uh, stuffy uh, that uh, comes out this week from Merry Makers. And last but not least, I'm not sure if you know this, but it is a children's book week. And I had the honor of drawing this year's poster and it has a wonderful question on it. How do you book? And I have to say that every once and again, I find myself reading and eating. How about you? <laughs> so thank you. So we're gonna have uh, some questions. Well, I have some questions for all of our awesome panelists. And, uh, and a lot of my questions uh, relate to the objects that they shared with us. So the first question I have is for Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Uh, so your story, Watercrest, is about food. It's about acceptance. It's about family, but your parents, never got to see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in part of your 
author's note at the back, you're talking about how you can speak to them. So how can you speak to your parents through a book when they will not see it? <laughs> That's such a good question, Kevin. Um, I do say in my author's note that this book, Watercrest, which is semi-autobiographical, um, is both an apology and a love letter to my parents because they did both pass away before the book uh, was published or even before I began writing it. And, you know, I think sometimes when we have loved ones who have passed away, we might write in our journals about it, or we might even write letters to them that we save. Um, and my way of writing to them was through this story, through this book, um, because you know, I wanted to express how sorry I was that I didn't understand what their own childhoods were like. Um, they had a very hard life in China and I didn't know any of that until I was much older. And it's a love letter too, because once I found out their history, I was just filled with gratitude for everything that they had done, that they had moved to this country and left everything they knew behind and created this wonderful new life for my brother and I. Um, so instead of writing them a letter, I wrote this story and it was published as a book so that everybody can kind of read it, which I think is really wonderful. And I hope that my parents, wherever they are, are feeling um, all the readers connect to their story and, and are, you know, hopefully sharing their own stories with their own families. I love that. It's, it's, it's sad. Part of, parts of it are beautiful. Well, all of it is beautiful. And parts of it are funny, right? Because there was one part in there where I just laughed out loud where, you know, they're driving through the countryside. You see the watercraft, they take it back home. And then the mom's like, it's free. And you know, like how many parents are like, you know, it was on sale. So-and-so gave it to me. We have to eat it. What? This, of course, is going to make it good. And so I was like, oh, wow. So it's universal feelings that people can relate to. It's a wonderful story. Thank you. Thank you. So my next question is for Cheryl. And she showed us uh, the paddle that you can use to stir and to bring out the rice out, out of a rice cooker. So in your A to Z book, I see someone, uh, Miss Stephanie Yaffe had a question, what is the A to Z book? So there are so many different foods. There are so many different instruments. There are all these new words that the readers are learning. There's so much information that we're getting from this book. How did you get all of that information? Because I'm sure there was a big research process going through all of that. So what was the most surprising thing that you learned when you were doing your research for the book? Yeah, thank you. That is a great question. Um, it was a long process and so much went into researching the different dishes that are covered in this A to Z book. Um, I love that you pointed that there are new words that aren't in English. That was one thing that I really wanted this A to Z book to be about, not translated um, names of the dishes, but in their native languages. Um, and so it may be new to readers, but I think that it's a great opportunity for children to learn the names of the dishes in those native languages for those cuisines. Um, some of them, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I was so lucky to be exposed to so many different cuisines from like the region um, and a lot of different kinds of Chinese cuisines as well. Um, my family is part Cantonese, part Shanghainese, so I was able to really, like at home, we ate a lot of um, those homemade meals for my grandparents. Um, and so I was familiar with some of them, especially um, for W is for wonton noodles, which is from my hometown, Hong Kong. I did include that one. And then a lot of them um, were also unfamiliar to me. So it was talking to people. It was trying them. Um, some of them that were new to me were like, um, there was a sweet noodle 
from India um, that was really special. That was like a custard kind of noodle. And I have not had a chance to try that one. So I would love to. Um, and yeah, I, I really researched and looked at a lot of imagery, talked to people from those um, from those cultures um, to kind of understand the nuances too, because some of the dishes uh, would have different variations depending on which part of the country um, that it would be from and how they would make it. So we tried to really represent that. And my illustrator and I worked very closely to look at how it would be presented, what the condiments would be, um, how, you know, what the dishware would be like. So I loved what you shared, Kevin, the, the bowl. We like looked at so many different kinds of bold and and um yeah the ornaments on the on the dishware that was one thing that we paid a lot of attention to so yeah that was part of the process and one of my favorite parts of the book is actually um creating a audio pronunciation guide so i speak chinese and i knew how to pronounce a lot of the um chinese dishes but not all my readers will and i also didn't know a lot of the you know this global alphabet book covers so many different languages so so I reached out to my community and got a lot of volunteers to help me record how to say it in their native language. Um, so we created that and added it um, to the QR code at the back of the book so you can access it, um, just scan it with your phone. And I love that because I've learned how to say so many new words, even as you know, um, I was creating the book, learning how to um, yeah, learning, learning about something I didn't. And I'm so happy to get to pass that on to little readers who get to encounter it in this alphabet book about global foods. I think that's great to hear that because so many readers, a lot of times when they get the book, they don't, they're thinking, oh, I'm learning from this. But then now we learn about how you actually went through a learning process as well to learn about all these different dishes, the utensils, how they were presented. And that's just amazing to see that level of attention to all that detail. Thank, Thank you. you. Eye opening, but it was also so much fun. Yeah. I mean, what a great job, right? Like your job is to go and eat and discover new things. How exciting. That's amazing. Michael, I have a question for you. So your book uh, is about family food traditions. And a lot of our family food traditions come from women, our grandmas, our aunts, our moms. And these women are passing down lessons that they would have learned from women before them. And you were talking in your show and tell about how it passes down from generation to generation. So what's something that, or what would you say is the most important thing that you learned from all of these women in your family? Oh, so thank you. I love the question, Kevin. It actually made me cry a little, I have to say. I dedicate this book, I thought I would share with you um, a dedication to the strong women in my life. Mi mamá, mi tía y mi abuela. Muchísimas gracias for making my life deliciosa. So it's a very heartfelt question. And I guess what I would say about what they taught me is that food is nourishing, of course, but that it's also nurturing. And it's food is so much more than what you see on the plate, right? Food is nurturing because it's imbued with, with love, right? With um, family history, especially those, those recipes that are passed on from one generation to the next. I think food is about connection. That's what they taught me. To family, of course, true tradition, but to ancestry, to heritage, I think to culture, to identity. It's, and food is a love language, right? You show love through the delicious food that you prepare, <clears throat> especially if you spend a lot of time preparing it. Um, I think in, in Latinx cultures, they tend to be more patriarchal, but in many households, in my, <clears throat> observations, it's the women that run the show, right? And at a home, I think things tend to be more matriarchal. Older women in particular, I think hold a kind of power um, and, and are respected as a, as a kind of source of, of wisdom. I, I think abuelas in particular, as they, as they age, especially if you're in a more religious Latinx home, can be revered almost like a saint. That was true in my family. 
I think sometimes because they begin to look, they, they begin, their look reflects indigenous roots. And I, I think it's a reminder of families, two families of where, where they came from. But on an everyday level, back to your question, I think the family food traditions in Latinx cultures anyway, come from women because of the love that's expressed in cooking. And I think women are seen as the center of family and home. So I think each meal is made with love and you share it with others. And I think that um, is, a, is a reminder of that, you know, shared love is a way that connects family. So that's, I think that's ultimately the message I got from my, my grandmother, my mom, my aunt. So thank you for yeah. your question. And I think so many of us, you know, when we're writing about food, you know, all of us have written about food here. I'm sure that everyone, when they were going through the process of writing, they're thinking about all those old ladies in, in your family that are passing it down, right? You know, and there's a mixture of nostalgia and sadness, you know, because you might miss them because they're no longer here. And you know, so many people have those experiences and everybody eats, right? Or wants to eat, right? You know, like there must be food insecurity in some families, but then we all do eat at least sometimes, right? So then this is something that we can all relate to. And I think it just makes everybody think and dream about those moments, especially of childhood, even as you grow up and become a grown up. And one thing that I thought about too, where you were saying that the grandmas are thought of as saints, I'm imagining like little girls now, right? You know, like a little five year old, like in kindergarten, one day when she gets older, she's gonna be that saint in the family, right? I, just, I love that, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you for that comment. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Raul, Hello. so you have, these amazing books, which I have in front of me right now, and I have two of them. These are only two of your many amazing books. You are the author and illustrator of your book. So when you are thinking about, okay, I have an idea of something that I'm going to write about. Do you think about that in pictures or do you think about the words of the story? What comes first? Um, I would say that it's a combination of all of the above. Um, it's a maybe even uh, Kevin smell is is in, in included in that. Um, but in the case of, for instance, vamos, uh, let's go eat. It was probably the title, vamos, let's go eat. And then I remember. I sat, yep, I sat down and uh, I, I, um, I basically made a list for myself of all of my favorite uh, dishes, all of the things that I loved to eat, still love to eat, some of the uh, dishes that I've discovered as an adult. And I, my list just happened to look like the end pages of, of Vamos, Let's Go Eat. And so I killed, you know, two birds with one stone. It was, it was pretty amazing. And then, of course, uh, I start, like any other uh, picture book is made, I, I began with, with a script and I started to uh, write about what, uh, write the story and write about everything that I was in going to include. And then I just began to have fun illustrating. And then that's when I discovered all of the little jokes and the fun details and stretchy cheese, you name it. <laughs> stretchy cheese. I love this book because on every, or these books, because on every page, there's so much to look at, right? And it's like one of these books that kids can come back to, you know, all kids love to read the same story over and over like a million times. But in this, 
you have to come back to it over and over because it's like, oh, look at this word here. What is going on here in the background, right? <laughs> all this business and it's like this village of all these people and these characters and these words and these foods and these objects. And it's just like a treasure chest that never stops. It's so incredibly rich. So let's ask all of our panelists here. We have Michael, Andrea, Cheryl, and Raul. Why do each of you write about food? What makes food so relatable? Who would like to start us off with that? Andrew. I'll, I'll go. Um, I think for me, it's because food connects us all. Like Michael was saying, it's a point of connection um, in watercress. The family eats the watercress together and they make new memories. Um, my strongest memories are food memories and they're associated with being with my family like Michael's are. And I actually wore my Chinese Lunar New Year shirt um, because I have so many memories of going to my grandparents' house with all my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. And it was always this big potluck feast and it was a celebration. Um, you know, like the theme today, right? It's celebration and culture and community. And I'm wondering, like you were saying, like so many of our memories are food related, mm. childhood memories. And it's like all five senses are working exactly. at yeah. the same time. We have smell and taste that are coming from the food. And then you're looking at the food. You can remember the environment, even the sounds. Like if you're at a fair or like Disneyland, you know, there's all the noises going around. If you're at dinner at your house, people are talking and laughing. Maybe, you know, a baby is crying. So everything, it's like this big imprint and it helps us to remember those awesome moments of people coming together and having a great time. What else does food mean in your literature, Michael? Mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna echo a lot of what you guys are, are saying. I think, first of all, as someone said earlier, everyone eats, right? And and so food is what we need for life. But um, hopefully, also food tastes good, right? So we we um, enjoy the the taste of food. But it, when you sort of think about, you know, moms or dads saying, "Dinner's ready," what happens? You know, a gathering, right? So everyone gathers around the table. And that happens every day. It happens in, on a larger scale around holidays or various uh, occasions where extended family gathers. So it's about tradition, right? It's about history. It's about collecting memories. So I think when we, we kind of return to a meal, you often reflect on, oh, I had that meal at some other point in time with whoever you happen to be with. So I think all these kinds of connections, as Andrea was saying earlier, happen between people, but also events and memories that you then hold and then pass on as you pass on cooking and recipes and sharing meals with next generations. I love that everyone comes running when there's food, right? What's everyone's favorite moment of the day in school when you're a student? lunchtime yeah. right you know like that is the best part it's a break from all the math the history the writing right everyone's there like screaming and laughing seeing what everybody else brought in their lunch box right it's exploration and it's also getting to know the people right yeah. my six-year-old daughter when you know she brings her lunch home like after the day and I'm like, oh, you ate all of your food or you didn't eat this. And then she'll say, well, Ines likes this. She likes spicy food, so I tried this, right? You know, so it's like you get to know your friends through their food. Mm -hmm. Raul, how do, what does food mean to you in your literature? Well, you know, I, I, I was thinking about that and, and I, I, I seem to always, um, and this, this piggybacks off of what you were saying, Michael, I always seem to use uh, food 
as a way to uh, bring everybody together or even to calm a situation down. So in the instance of uh, vamos, let's cross the bridge, everybody is beginning to get really upset because they've been stuck on their bridge in their cars for who knows how long. And people are starting to honk their horns. They're screaming out the windows, you know? And suddenly out of the blue, um, a food truck's light bulb goes off and they just decide to open up shop right there on the bridge. And everybody gets so excited and happy by the smells and by the prospect of, oh boy, I'm going to at least be able to salivate over this delicious meal, uh, maybe sit on the hood of my car and, and enjoy life as it, as it passes by me. And I think that's what, what I love about food so much is like we've all been saying, it just brings us together. It allows us to, to communicate um, and, um, much easier because we're, we're, PR, we're eating and we're talking, we're having a great time and um, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think of all the moments if you ever go and visit somebody over to their house and they don't have food, it is disappointing, <laughs> right? You know, like, you, you know, like you go over to someone's house and they're like, can I offer you water? Yeah, well, okay, you can get water anywhere, right? <laughs> but they're not like bringing out like some chips and salsa or like some ice cream, right? You, it's almost like an expectation that they're going to give you something when you go and visit. Right? Yeah, like, that's like, what... your, like your daughter. You, you might even want to discover a new dish that, that someone makes, right? Yeah, yeah. It, I, I love that. It brings people together. It can also, you know, divide if people do not have food. You know, it's like, I don't want to go back over that house. It's not fun, right? They don't have anything good over there. Yeah, so Cheryl, what can food say to you? Yeah, I echo so much of what has already been shared. Um, but for me personally, my story was um, I started writing about food because I wanted to pass on my heritage to my daughter. So as a new mom, um, I grew up in Hong Kong and I was now starting a family, raising a child in the US. And I was thinking, how do I pass on this part of like, culture and my life and my past to her. And I think of food as such a good introduction to culture. It's something, even though we are not in Hong Kong and I'm not raising my daughter there, um, I can still introduce her to foods from Hong Kong in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, we have a lot of options. So um, yeah, that's a really special kind of motivation for me. And um, my first book that I wrote for her was about foods from Hong Kong. And it includes a lot of my favorites that we've slowly been eating through and just like introducing to her. And um, yeah, gradually um, my series, which goes through different cities and introduces the cuisines from there. It helps connect people to like a place maybe that they've never been or a place that their grandparents are from. And it's just really special to yeah, be able to introduce that to, to readers and for you know even the adult readers as they're sharing it with their children, um, for them to be able to revisit those foods that they have fond memories for. At least for me as an author, every time I read something, um, I can recall those foods that I've had in my past. And also it gives me motivation to try something new. I've actually heard about foods mentioned here today that I have not tried, but I'm very curious. And that is going to give me a window into a culture that is not familiar to me. So um, yeah, that's my, that's my motivation. And I'm so happy to get to do it. The window into culture. I think, you know, in, in most cities, there will be a market that you can go to uh, that is not your regular supermarket, but it's like a, they might call them specialty markets, whether it's like, you know, a all over pan Asian market or an Indian market or a Turkish market. And you can go in there and see all of these different brands of foods, these different vegetables, the things that they might have a whole aisle dedicated to, which you might not have in like a Safeway or a grocery store. And it's almost like visiting that place 
and you don't even have to leave your hometown. I mean, I love going to Chinatown in New York City. You know, and there's all these like old ladies and me in this market and we're like pushing on each other, like trying to get food. I, that's my favorite thing about New York. So we have a question here from anonymous attendee uh, that says that story about the kids' friends' lunches is great. Any other thoughts on how grown-ups reading your books uh, to kids who hope to connect food to greater cultural understanding can also more consciously make moments with food from different cultures about more than just the eating? Any thoughts on small ways to make it also about thinking about the humanity of others? That's a great question. So how would we use food to talk about more than just eating and also about uh, talking, thinking about the humanity of others? Um, in, in Vamos, Let's Go Eat, um, there's this there's a sequence in in the book that uh, talks about how um, the the vendors themselves help each other out. For instance, um, the elotero, the, the guy who sells corn, gives his corn husks to um, the woman who makes the tamales, and and so there's like this little community of of, of characters that help each other out by giving each other the things that they specialize in so that they can make other other things or a combination of things with those with those ingredients. And then I also have this um, a food truck that's called the Kimchi Kiosko and it sells uh, they sell Korean tacos at the Kimchi Kiosko and Korean tacos, were something that I discovered uh, about five years ago when I visited uh, Los, Los Angeles, Los Angeles. And um, I felt that it was a wonderful way of how uh, different cultures can influence each other to create something brand new and exciting. I love this question. And um, I think that's, was one of my goals in writing Watercress was to show our common humanity. Um, because in Watercress, the girl really doesn't want to pick the watercress and she really, really doesn't want to eat it until her mom explains uh, and tells her a story of her own childhood growing up in China when they were, you know, suffering from a famine. And this is history that the child didn't know and something she didn't know about her own mother and that completely changed the way that she felt about her parents and her own heritage and i've been hearing so many stories from readers about how they also um, foraged with their families or you know had not learned a lot about their family history and so i think that all of our books are a great starting point that to spark these kinds of conversations about the foods that our families used to eat and their childhood histories. Um, and yeah, and in that way, show how we have all these universal emotions and this shared humanity. Yeah, yeah I, I love that, that response. And I, I was just thinking about, I, it seems to me every uh, recipe, again, steeped in family tradition has a story to tell. And if you know that story and uh, you are able to share it, including what the different ingredients mean, where they come from, tell that story to uh, you know, your children as you cook together, hopefully in the kitchen, there's so much to share, but uh, it's, like, um, it's like having a garden at home too, like teaching kids how to, where, where, where food comes from. <laughs> you know, they learn so much from having their own uh, garden and again from cooking, but I think they also spark conversations to the the point about shared humanity. How um, you know different cultures gather around food, but also about people who are food insecure too. That um, 
I think the range of conversations around food uh, varies and can be incredibly uh, rich. And, and I think can be meals can be a time to obviously talk, but also teach, right? Without being too message heavy. But if you, I think if you start with fun, like cooking together or having a garden and having natural conversations about things, um, there's so much that can come out from, come out of those conversations about, um, about people, about humanity and how we're all, all connected. I just a little anecdote. I remember when my daughter, uh, our daughter was young. We were in, I don't remember where, some other country and she was like five or six and we were uh, sitting down to eat and she just kind of looked around um, and she saw other families, of course, who looked very different from us uh, sitting down to eat. And her comment was, you know what? People are kind of the same. And we're like, what? What do you mean? Well, look, those kids just got back from school. They're gathering. It looks like dad just got back from work and mom has, you know, like uh, groceries or something, but they're, they're eating now as a family. And that's what we all do, right? So it just was so touching, right? That you know, kids observe things and that she, you know, made that discovery at such a young age around, in this case, around food and gathering. Um, I love this question so much. I was just thinking about my, my books and what I want people to take away from it. And that is awareness and um, also acceptance. Um, my books explore diversity, so different Asian cities, um, and I don't shy away from including foods that are maybe unfamiliar to an American audience. So um, from my Taipei book, that's stinky tofu, which is very pungent if you've ever <laughs> encountered it. Um, there's chicken feet in my Hong Kong book. There's grilled eel from my book about Tokyo. And so these might be foods that are unfamiliar, um, but I hope that being aware of it also helps you understand that other cultures and cuisines really enjoy this. And yeah, just be open-minded to the different flavors and the different um, foods all around the world. So we have one more question, all right. Um, from Lauren. All right. Could you each share one meal with a loved one? Oh, this is making me like, oh. whether they are still with us or not, what meal would you eat and who would you share it with? I can go first. Yeah, Cheryl. Uh, I would share a meal with my grandmother who is in Hong Kong um, with my children. So unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, she has not been able to meet my children many times. Um, she was only able to meet my son once. And I have so many fond memories of my grandmother's home cooking. And so much of what Michael has shared resonated with me. So I would just really love to be able to bring those generations together and see them share a meal together. Uh, Lauren, this is like an impossible question, but, but a good one. It, I think that, I think I'd want to share a meal with my, uh, great grandmother who I knew as a little boy who, uh, frightened me because she spoke only Spanish, but she had a single tooth and she was, I could not understand a lot of her. Spanish. She was very indigenous looking. And, um, and so I was frightened her of her as a little, uh, as a little boy. And so the stories that I'm writing now sort of reach back into my heritage and um, sort of turn fear into joy, right? Uh, as far as being able to write about uh, family tradition and heritage. So to so maybe sit down with a Tamale, tamale dinner with her, this woman who, you know, spawned all these children in multiple, you know, generations and be able to now have a conversation 
with her um, over over tamales. That would be that would be super fun. Yeah. <laughs> Molly's with great grandma. What about you, Raul? Um, well, you know, uh, one thing that I really always enjoy. Um, and I still, every time, anytime I go back home to El Paso is my mom will make me a fre fresh uh, batch of uh, tortillas. And since I was a little boy, she would always hand me the first one uh, coated in butter and I, and I eat it. And it's the most delicious yeah. uh, thing I, I have ever eaten and will probably ever eat. Uh, but also, um, you know, my, uh, my mother-in-law passed away earlier this year and just thinking about her pierogies, she made delicious pierogies uh, with, uh, I think there were prunes in them, which when I, when I first was gonna try them, I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be disgusting. Uh, but as a matter of fact, they were delicious and I love them. So I, I would like to, to eat that again at some point. And I think I would actually like to go back and <clears throat> celebrate Thanksgiving with my extended family, um, my grandparents and my parents who are no longer with us um, because their culture didn't have a Thanksgiving. <laughs> and, but when they came here, they were like, all right, a chance to get together and, and eat and, and you know we have the day off. And they made it their own. There was never turkey because no one liked turkey. And it was this big braised pork shoulder that my grandfather would make. And, you know, I've had it in a lot of restaurants since, and it's just not the same. And, you know, all of the side dishes were not the side dishes that your typical American Thanksgiving. Um, but there would be pie. So that was great because, like, there aren't a lot of Chinese desserts that are like that. But I just miss having everybody around and, you know, just it's chaos and fun and cousins falling asleep after Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's just that warmth um, that I, I would love to experience again. I love it when people fall asleep after Thanksgiving. Because, <laughs> you, know, you know, everyone is like, they've eaten, they're around people they feel safe with, and they feel relaxed enough to just fall asleep <laughs> in front of everyone. That's, yeah. that's a wonderful thing. That, that was a really tear jerky question. It was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was like, oh, Lauren, <laughs> you're making everybody <laughs> sob inside. <laughs> I like to go for the jugular, friend. <laughs> Real quick before we wrap up, Kevin, I, I know you're a moderator, but I'm just so curious. If you could share a meal with anyone, who would it be and what meal? Mm. Well, there's an easy one and there's a hard one. My mother just died a couple of months ago. So then I'd want to uh, probably make fry bread with her. Um, but if I had to like kind of go outside of family, I have all these, my favorite people, my ancestors, my favorite artists on the wall behind me. I think I would have to cook an indigenous meal with like fry bread, wild onions, grape dumplings for Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, wow. I love Eleanor. I, I, I have this obsession with Eleanor. I love her. And so I, and I, she was very open, you know, at a period of time when people were not really that open. And I think she was like very strong, you know, and she like kind of broke a lot of barriers and didn't really, and she knew how to break barriers, but like within a way that was comfortable for people. And so I would just love to kind of, if we had to do a famous person, right? Not a family person, be Eleanor Roosevelt and I'd make other things that I can make the best. Kevin, that sounds like a book. Meal with <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh my God. All right, thank you. Thank you, that's amazing. <laughs> Well, friends, we are sadly out of time. I know I wish we could do this all day long. I guess our authors and illustrators have like lives and things they have to get back to. <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here today. Kevin, thank you so much for moderating. 
Cheryl, Raul, Andrea, Michael, thank you for being our panelists. What an amazing job you all did. Friends, how about a really quick virtual round of applause once again for these amazing creators. Woo! And for those of you that would like to get any of these books, please keep an eye out for that Indies Unite link, which is going to be sent out after the show, after this event. Um, thank you to everyone at Indies Unite, bookshop.org, Children's Book Council, and Children's Book Week for helping us put on such an amazing celebration. I'm Lauren from Indies Unite. Thank you all for being here, friends. Happy reading. Enjoy. Thank you for having reading. us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Kevin. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.